um, you may want to send them a, send them a link to it. Um, so, um, <laughs> sometimes I'm asked by people, well, you know, when you boil, boil and ride down, Andrew, what, what, what are you really all about, all this traveling around and riding? I said, well, I'm just going around the country uh, stirring up optimism. And that's what I'm going to do right now. If you're a pessimist this morning, uh, you're going to be sadly disappointed by this talk. Um, I'm going to talk about the biblical case for Christian victory. And by, that, by that I mean victory for the kingdom of God in history before the final definitive victory in the eternal state. All Christians believe, all Orthodox Christians believe, that when Christ returns, whenever that is, and he ushers in the eternal state, um, and this world as we know it, the sinful world is over, that obviously that will be a time of great victory and great final perfection. So that's not really the issue today. The issue is can we have substantial Christian victory, that is victory for the gospel, victory for the word of God, victory for the power of the spirit of God, victory for the church, the Christian family. Can we have substantial victory before that time? That's the question I'm really going to be addressing, and that's what I mean when I talk about Christian victory. Uh, of course, I don't have time to give some fully formed, pervasive case, but I'll, I'm going to point out several biblical texts that I hope will have you consider this message of victory. Uh, the failure of today's church is largely a failure of its eschatological expectations. Yes, I'll explain that. Uh, eschatology is, somebody finish it for me, the study of last end things, last things. That uh, comes from the eschaton, the last, the final, the end. A study of last things. By the way, just as everybody has a Christian worldview, so everybody has an eschatology. It might not be worked out. It might not be fully formed. It may never have been articulated. But everybody has an idea of how things are going to work out. Uh, the church today is confused uh, and divided in its eschatology. And it's weighed down with unbelief toward the massive promises of the Word of God. It's weighed down with unbelief. The vision that I'm presenting this morning will require great faith it will require faith. But the Bible says in Hebrews 11, without faith it's impossible to please God. The Bible says whatever is not of faith is sin. So I'm asking you and asking the Lord to help us be included, to have greater faith in God's promises. Um, eschatology, I said, is last things, but it also involves first things. In theological vocabulary, Here's another vocab word, right? Got eschatology now? Eschatology presupposes protology. Now, if eschatology means last things, take a wild guess what protology means. First, first things. things. First things. Okay. Well, I hope to inspire in you today the hope of a victorious um, eschatology. Now, sometimes it's called postmillennialism. I've got that little primer on it. Want to read about. And there are other books much longer and more in depth that are excellent. I'm an unashamed post millennialist. And by the way, uh, to those who think this is sort of some freaky, unprecedented liberal idea, many, not all, but many of our Puritan forefathers were post millennial. Uh, Jonathan Edwards, for example, was post millennial. John Owen was post, what we, the word wasn't there, but that's what they believed, what we call today post-millennialism. You're post-millennial. Um, I have come to believe that might not be the best term to describe a victorious eschatology, and just let me tell you why. Nothing inherently wrong with it, but basically, there's that word millennial or millennium. What does that refer to? Well, six times in the book of Revelation, in Revelation chapter 20, John uses that term, thousand years, which is a millennium. Most everybody agrees it doesn't have to be a literal thousand years. It just means a very long time. Well, the only problem with the term post-millennial is people somehow think that if you get that interpretation 
of Revelation 20 wrong, postmillennialism can't be right. So when people ask me, point in the Bible to where it teaches postmillennialism, I said, well, we're going to have to start with Genesis 1-1. So this victorious eschatology isn't limited to a particular interpretation of Revelation chapter 20. It's basically what the Bible teaches. Here's what I'm going to do today. Just two parts to this. First, the Bible teaches the kingdom of God, the gospel kingdom of Jesus Christ, is coterminous, that just means simultaneous, with the present age, with the present age, and will expand before Christ returns to usher in the eternal state. Um, you say, Andrew, that sounds like you're saying that things basically historical will get better and better. Yes, but I don't mean by that what liberals, the old-fashioned liberals mean by that. I don't mean they will naturally get better and better. I mean they will supernaturally get better and better by the preaching of the gospel of Jesus Christ under the power of the Spirit of God and in accordance with the written word of God, the law of God. Second thing I'll point out is what we believe about eschatology isn't just an academic concern. So we can't just say, well, yeah, well, you're a theologian, and uh, Larry's a theologian, and so you're, we're, they talk about eschatology. It's not really a matter of my concern. No, actually, I'm going to try to show you that your view of eschatology shapes your entire life. So you remember this. Ideas have consequences. After World War II, Richard Weaver, conservative, wrote a book of that title. Ideas have consequences. Bad ideas have bad consequences. <laughs> and bad theological ideas have the worst consequences of all. So we need to get rid of bad theological ideas because they have bad consequences. Okay, so I'm just going to take this quick survey addressing just several biblical texts in which this optimistic eschatology, this post-millennial eschatology seems so clear. I hope he's fastened. Now some of these texts I'll read, not long texts, but you might want to write them down or listen to it. If I remember it'll probably be out on the web tonight. So God created the entire cosmos, the universe. He fashioned man and woman in his image. He placed them in a lush garden. It's garden of Eden. He gave them one chief commission, subdue and cultivate the earth for his glory. <clears throat> He says, exercise dominion. Now I want to stop just briefly there and say something that we don't often catch. Notice he didn't say that their chief earthly responsibility is to have a warm, pious relationship with him. Now certainly they were to do that. But as far as man's calling in the earth, as it relates to the earth, man's chief calling is called, we can call it the cultural mandate, the dominion commission, Man was placed on this earth by God. He was created by God in one day, one out of six. He was created chiefly on earth to exercise dominion righteously in terms of God's authority over the earth. By the way, this is equally given to men and women. It's not just for men. Given to both of them, man and woman, to exercise dominion over this entire earth. One way to put it, here's another metaphor. Do you like metaphors? Here's one. <laughs> it's as though God, who is the ultimate authority in the universe, could be no higher authority, utterly sovereign. It's as though God said, you know what, I'm going to create man as a subordinate to me, created in my image, but I'm not going, for the most part, to directly oversee creation at all. Now, do you know that God does it? Not his, so his sovereignty works. <laughs> his providence is everywhere. But God doesn't sort of come down all the time and do specific things. He calls his people to do many things. He, and here's the metaphor I promised it, didn't I? Uh, he puts a, a sheriff's badge. He puts a sheriff's badge on us and says, I'm deputizing you under my authority, not autonomously, under my authority to exercise dominion over this earth. Now, you'd think that people would take this seriously to believe the Bible. This is the, I mean, you can read it there in the verses 27 through 30, 28 through 30 of uh, Genesis 1. I mean, had, he, had God said something else there, had he told Adam something else, had he told Adam, your main calling is going to be, and sorry, buddy, you're going to fall, you'll be, is to win souls, people would just sort of 
grasp onto that and say, this is, this is an amazing commission. I mean, this is so important. This is what God told man to do from the beginning. You would think whatever he told man to do from the beginning would be really emphasized. Yet in how many churches today do we ever hear sermons about the cultural mandate or the Dominion Commission? Now, it's certainly not the only thing in the Bible, and it's not the most important thing in the Bible. The most important thing in the Bible, of course, is God himself and his being and his character. But it's pretty important because this is our calling. I didn't intend to say all that, but I'm sure glad I did. <laughs> This Dominion Commission was God's plan for expanding his kingdom in the earth. This basically, this, is the Bible's first eschatology. Actually, sort of creational eschatology even comes before that. But this is one aspect of that first eschatology. The victory plan was there from the very first. So when people say, well, if you go to Revelation for all your eschatology, I said, no, let's start in Genesis 1. Adam and Eve sinned, and that provoked God's judgment, but that didn't, God didn't scrap his plan. Didn't. I like what one writer says, God doesn't make junk, and he doesn't junk what he makes. God doesn't make junk, and he doesn't junk what he makes. This created world originally wasn't junk. God saw it at the very end and didn't say just that it was good. He said what? Very. It's very good. If I can say so reverently, God, as it were, says to himself, you know what, I did a pretty good job here. It's very good. So even when man sinned, even when he imposed the curse on man, and secondarily because of man, on creation, that didn't make the world inherently bad. It is under a curse. But creation itself, inherently, is very good. And then he put his plan of redemption in this place, and that part of that redemption plan is, of course, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Son of God, God of very God, man of very man in the language of the creed. So, we read in Genesis 3.15, and all of you have read this text, and if you haven't, you should. God, of course, is speaking uh, to the man, and he says, And I'll put enmity between you and the woman, and between your seed and her seed. He shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise his heel. This was the first gospel sermon, and God the Father was the world's first gospel preacher. If somebody asks you, where is the first gospel sermon in the Bible? Some people would say, I think it's Acts chapter 2, Peter preaching at Pentecost. Or maybe it was Jesus uh, when he talked about giving his life as a ransom. Or maybe Isaiah, in Isaiah 53, about the suffering servant. No, those are all wonderful, but that's not the first gospel message. Genesis chapter 3, verse 15 is first gospel message of the Bible. In fact, it's often called the Proto-Proto-Evangelium. The first, pro, again, pro, first gospel message. <clears throat> the offspring, the seed or offspring of the woman is Jesus Christ. The seed of the serpent is Satan and all of his minions and followers. The seed of the woman was to crush the head of the seed of the serpent. And that quote, by the way, I, it was spoken actually to the serpent, although Adam and Eve were there. On the cross and from the empty tomb, God fulfilled this Genesis 3.15 promise. That is, in this language of one's heel crushing the head or putting on the neck of one's opponent. That's ancient Semitic language. Often when a, a king or a great military warrior of a king would defeat an army, he would have the leader or the king of the opposing army or opposing nation or tribe brought to him and would visibly put his put on his head or neck. Well, the scripture says that the seed of the woman, Jesus Christ, would crush the head of the, and by the way, that's actually a literal translation in Hebrew. It's not just bruise. It's, it's crush the head of the seed of the serpent. And the serpent seed, Satan and his dominions, would often crush the heel, that is a minor wound, of the seed of the woman. And of course, that's Christ who was crushed on cross. Satan gets a very small victory temporarily and of course Christ gets the ultimate comprehensive victory. So sin entered on the plane of human history so victory had to occur on the plane of human history. Now what I'm saying by that is this. Um, we can't say that our victories are quote spiritual victories. 
they're not concerned with this world and this life. And uh, we get all our victories in heaven. No. Adam and Eve fell. They fell into sin on the plane of human history. The curse occurs within history. Right? I mean, you get aches in your legs. I mean, you will when you get older. <laughs> you have people say nasty stuff about you that they shouldn't. All this bad stuff, sin. Well, that doesn't like happen in some ethereal, floaty realm. That happens here. Well, in the same way, the work of redemption has to happen here and not somewhere else. Um, now, note carefully, Jesus didn't die only to take away our sins. He did that, of course. Man is God's crowning creation, and therefore man figures prominently in God's plan. But the goal of the cross was not to take people to heaven when they die. The goal of the cross, in fact, isn't limited to salvation. Now, understand the difference in these terms. We sometimes equate the gospel with salvation, personal salvation, but they're not the same thing. Salvation is God's means of redeeming man and granting him eternal life, sovereignly. But the gospel is deeper than that. The gospel is the good news. What is the good news? That God, in Christ, is reversing all of the evil that Satan and our first parents unleashed at the fall. So the gospel is cosmic good news. It's big good news. Now salvation is a vital part of the gospel. The gospel is what makes salvation possible in the first place. So this victorious eschatology starts with a victorious protology in Genesis 1. And it's furthered by these promises of Jesus Christ in Genesis 3. Now, I'd like us quickly to look forward in a remarkable book, the book of Daniel. Um, you don't have to turn there. Listen, I'll quote a little bit of this, and this is vital to understand. Now, Daniel is one of the Old Testament prophets, and like uh, virtually all of the others, he prophesies of his own days and the days about anywhere from 400 to 600 years in the future. Not our future, his future. Daniel is a prophesying about what they call the last days. He's not. He wasn't prophesying about his own days or the days following ours. Uh, Daniel isn't about Christ's second coming. Daniel is about Christ's first coming. Now consider, consider Daniel 2. How many of you here have heard about Daniel's interpretation of Nebuchadnezzar's dream? It's a dream about the great image. Do you know what I'm talking about? Okay, I'll just kind of refresh your memory here. In this particular vision, Daniel saw uh, four great ancient empires, uh, Babylon, Persia, Greece, and Rome. Uh, well, I mean, Nebuchadnezzar saw it, but Daniel actually had the interpretation of the vision. Babylon, Persia, Greece, and Rome as body parts on a great image. Okay? There was actually the head that corresponded to Babylon all the way down to the legs and feet that corresponded to the Roman Empire. Now do you remember it? Okay. It's important. Uh, but then we read this in verses 34 and 35. Daniel's uh, addressing Nebuchadnezzar. You watched while a stone was cut out without hands. A stone just sort of magically appears, cut out of the mountain. What struck the image on its feet of iron and clay and broke them in pieces. So here's this little stone. Here we are just sitting there. We're watching this huge image. And as we just created our next to look at the top, and over in the mountain over here, there's just a little stone that just somehow magically breaks off and it's hurled toward the feet of this image. And when it hit these feet and legs, it broke them in pieces. And then the iron, the clay, and then the bronze, silver, and gold were crushed together. In other words, the feet crumbled and then everything came down. The whole thing collapsed and became like, here's another metaphor, but this is the Lord's and not mine, like chaff from the summer threshing floor. The wind carried them away so that no trace of them was found. That happened historically, by the way. That's so true. And the stone that struck the image became a great mountain and filled the whole earth. What a bizarre, strange, awesome picture that would be. This stone appeared out of nowhere on earth, and it was hurled by the sovereign God. And that stone, according to the Bible, was none other than Jesus Christ. That was hurled at the Roman Empire and its kingdom. It began very small. Did it not? Did it begin very small? I mean, its, it's very beginning was just in a, in a little stable outside with the animals. 
But that kingdom that started so small crushed the ancient earthly empires. There's not a bit of the dust left. You want to go find the Roman Empire? You want to go find Alexander the Great and the Greek Empire? You want to find the, the ancient Persian Empire? You want to go find the ancient Babylon and the great king of Nebuchadnezzar? Good luck with that. There's nothing of them left. But that little kingdom that little stone that grew as a mountain and filled the whole earth is still around. Now, here's the main thing I want to say about that. It was in verse 44, Daniel 2, 44. And in the days of these kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed, and the kingdom shall not be left to other people. It shall break in pieces and consume all these kingdoms, and it shall stand forever. This little stone that became a mountain. You see those first words in the days of these kings? Uh, that is, in the days of the Romans, this kingdom began. Not the days of Joe Biden, Vladimir Putin. <laughs> in the days of the ancient empire, the feet of the image. In that age, God would hurl a stone and smash the entire image, and the stone would grow to a mountain filling the earth. Some of you know of several hundred years after Jesus Christ, the collapse of the Roman gradual collapse overtaken by barbarians. And it happened. Christianity and the church survived. The Roman Empire did not. This is Jesus' first coming, not his second coming. At his first coming, God established his kingdom, just a little kingdom at first in a Bethlehem manger. That kingdom will grow and crush all other kingdoms. That's Daniel's prophecy. You know, sometimes people come up to me and protest but wait a minute, Andrew, don't you believe in the New World Order? And I say, yes, I do. And I know who's running it. He's the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. He's the stone cut without hands. He destroyed the ancient empires. He established his own cosmic empire at the right hand of the Father. Yes, this is the New World Order, and there will not be another. There will not be another. There hasn't been a great world empire after that. We speak, of course, of the British Empire. It was far-reaching. It was not a world empire. We speak of the Ottoman Empire. It was not a world empire. Some speak of the American Empire. Well, sorry, but it's not a world empire. There is only one world empire left, and that is Jesus Christ's empire. And on the basis of the promises of the Word of God, there will not be another one. It will not and cannot be supplanted. It cannot be, because Jesus Christ is ruling. Uh, now let's consider another of uh, Daniel's visions real quickly, and then I'll, uh, I'll go on to the New Testament. Um, so Daniel sees another vision. Daniel, the second half of Daniel, was seeing a bunch of visions. It was scary to him. In fact, reading Daniel, he was, sometimes he was just frightened and shaken by these vivid images God's showing him. I'm sure one reason they were so vivid is it would make such an, God wanted to make a real impression on him, and it did. So Daniel says, I was watching in the night visions, and behold, one like the Son of Man. Wait a minute. The Son of Man, the Son of Man. I remember reading about that in the Gospels. In the Gospels, who is the Son of Man? Jesus Christ. So remember. I saw one like the Son of Man coming with the clouds of heaven. He came to the Ancient of Days. The Ancient of Days. Is that, is that familiar at all? In the Bible, who is the Ancient of Days? Do you know? Um, you know Yes, God the Father is the Ancient of Days. It's clear in Isaiah 43, 13, he's called that. And they brought him, meaning the Son of Man, Jesus, before him, the antecedent to that pronoun is the Father. So he was, Jesus Christ was brought before the Father. Then to him, that is to Jesus, was given dominion and glory and a kingdom that all peoples, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away, and his kingdom the one which shall not be destroyed. Now, you hear this language, <coughs> excuse me, about one coming on the clouds. People think, oh, that's Jesus returning on the clouds at the second coming when he will have his kingdom. He will establish it in Jerusalem and reign in Jerusalem for a thousand years. Well, there, there's a problem with that. This passage in Daniel says that Actually, after this coming, whatever this coming is, Jesus is brought before the Father. 
Well, there's only one other time mentioned in the Bible where Jesus is coming somewhere in the clouds and then comes before the Father. And what is that? Resurrection. Yes, it's resurrection and ascension. Jesus Christ speaks to his disciples, and the Bible says a cloud received him out of their sight, and he was taken up into heaven. Well, now, we learn something truly remarkable from this. When Jesus Christ ascended into heavens to the Father, he ascended to take his throne. Incidentally, uh, Peter preaches this plainly in Acts chapter 2. Read Acts chapter 2. Peter says that, and other biblical texts. So think of this. 2,000 years ago in heaven, the ancient of days, was preparing Jesus Christ's coronation chair. Some of you have been to London. Have you ever been into Westminster Abbey and seen Edward's coronation chair? I just, when I first saw that, I just, the hair stood up on my arm. Because above it, you remember what? Above it is emblazoned. We read that great revelation. The kingdoms of this world have become the kingdoms of the Lord in his Christ. And so many, not all, but so many uh, British royalty were forced, actually, and even recently, uh, King Charles, and it sat right there in that same coronation chair, was forced to read this. The kingdoms of this world have become the It's basically a reminder to the great kings and queens of England, yes, you're a king of this country, but you are subordinate to another king. And in the end, he is the only king that matters. God was preparing Jesus Christ's coronation chair, the Father was. When Jesus Christ ascended to his throne room, the angels and the emissaries brought the Son before the Father. By the way, heaven in the Bible is, is depicted as an as sort of an ancient Near Eastern court. You see it in, uh, in Job and elsewhere. There was the great king, and around him are all of his emissaries and all that derive their benefit uh, from, from him. And any standing they have is not their own autonomously, but from him. And even Satan, we read in the book of Job, must come. Even Satan must come and report to the sovereign king in this great royal court. At that time, after the ascension, the son was formally installed. He was already king, but he was formally installed. Just as uh, we've talked about Charles in England, just as he was king the moment his mother died. But he wasn't formally installed until a couple of months ago. And he was, he, not Charles, Jesus, was crowned king of kings and lord of lords over the entire cosmos. He then sat down, that's the language we read in the scripture. I love the language of Hebrews 1. Sat down waiting until his enemies were to be made his footstool. And that's in 1 Corinthians 15 and other texts. Jesus was king from his birth, but his formal reign was instituted at his ascension. So Jesus Christ is presently ruling from his heavenly throne. Now that may bring up questions like, well, if he's ruling from his heavenly throne, why is all this bad stuff happening? I'll get to that in a minute. Let's move quickly to the New Testament. I consider the parable of Matthew 12, 28, 29. Um, if you remember that one, um, the uh, Pharisees accused Jesus when he would cast out devils of doing it by Satan's power. What an idiotic idea. It was blasphemous, of course. How utterly illogical. Satan wouldn't destroy his own house. And moreover, the kingdom's a present reality. We read that right there. The kingdom of God, Jesus said, has come to you. Um, Jesus said, if I cast out demons by the Spirit of God, surely the kingdom of God has come upon you. Or how can you enter a strong man's house and plunder, steal his goods, unless you first bind the strong man and then will plunder his house? Well, in that metaphor, the one Satan is kind of the strong man that has held all of, you mean specifically there, all of these people in demon possession. And when Jesus Christ casts the demons, he is the one who comes and binds Satan. And the Bible says he doesn't only rescue these people, he plunders, he steals, he takes everything away. At his first coming, not his second coming. Um, Jesus Christ came preaching the kingdom. He states it right there. When Jesus Christ came the first time, he bound the strong householder. The strong man of Satan who goes up and down on the earth, tempting and wreaking havoc and taking prisoners and trying to spread his depraved kingdom. But when Jesus came, he bound the devil and plundered his house. Um, Christians who oppose this victorious eschatological view say that because we can't see all of this happening at once, the kingdom is postponed until the second advent. I'm afraid they're very wrong. Hebrews chapter 1 itself says we don't yet see all things being placed under Christ's feet, but we will eventually see them. In other words, and this is an important point, 
Jesus Christ is presently ruling from heaven. Never have any more rule than he has right now. King of kings and Lord, lords. But his kingdom extends itself incrementally or gradually. In other words, there are still rebels down here in his kingdom, on his good earth. There are still rebels wanting to control things. And this is a point that's important to understand. God is sovereign. In a millisecond, God could destroy all of them and become visibly the king so everybody will see that. And the Bible says in Philippians 2, everyone will one day see that. He could do that. Why has he done that? Why does God allow all of this sin as much as he hates it? Because God's long-suffering. And God wants his people to fulfill the cultural mandate, the great commission he gave them. See, God's strong enough and sovereign enough to get rid of it all at once. But he doesn't want to do that. He says, no, you're going to have to be responsible. To us, he says, you're going to have to be responsible. I'm going to use you, not in your autonomy, but by the power of the Spirit and by the Word of God and the preaching of the Gospel and the Church and these other legitimate means. I'm going to use you to extend my kingdom and dominion. And one day it will be fulfilled just as if God himself did it. It's only through his power. Now, in light of these truths, it's, it's uh, imperative to understand that Jesus Christ is presently King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Uh, Jesus came upward on the clouds of his ascension 2,000 years ago to assume his heavenly throne that rules the world. It's not something that's going to happen yet in the future. Okay, final point. Eschatology shapes all of our lives. Um, many people seem not to believe this view. They live in the twilight zone of eschatological agnosticism. You know what that means? That means basically they say it doesn't matter what you believe about eschatology. And so some of them say, oh, well, you know, I'm just a pan-millennialist. Have you ever heard anybody say that? I'm a pan-millennialist. What do they mean by that? It's all just going to pan out in the end. So you want to be post-mail? Good for you. I'm on mail. Or uh, I'm pre-mail. Or I'm a dispensational pre-mail. We all have our different views, and it doesn't really matter. It's just that we all love Jesus. Well, I don't doubt that uh, they all love the Lord Jesus, but it does matter. Uh, it's dead wrong. So um, if you believe that the world is destined to grow depraved, and that the church and the kingdom will grow weaker and weaker, and that Jesus will rapture the church away before this great beast or antichrist comes to persecute the world. Your view on our current responsibilities will be radically different than if you don't believe these things. Uh, let me give you three quick examples of that. A couple of years ago, I was talking to a friend in Kansas. Uh, he's a trust officer at a local bank. We were discussing eschatology, and he was making this very point. I'd always kind of intuitively assumed this was true, but it was good to hear a, a bank officer tell me. Uh, there are a lot of Christians there in a wonderful church uh, in Pratt, Kansas, a lot of Christians that work in the bank. Um, I wish we had more Christians working in banks, but particularly the CEOs. Uh, so my friend noted that his Christian clients who hold to this sort of gloom and doom eschatology, the things are going to get worse, he says they invest their money differently. They don't invest in long-term projects. They think about how their money can benefit them in the shortest period of time. Well, that's logical from their premise. If Jesus is going to be coming back before breakfast next Thursday, <laughs> man, I want to make I want to make 35% of my money overnight. They have this narrow eschatological expectation, therefore they live very narrow investment lives. If, however, you believe that your faithful great-grandchildren will inherit the earth, you'll invest in them. And in projects, long-term projects. Here's a bizarre example. This is a second example. Um, I knew a Christian couple um, many years ago. It seemed they were just poorly suited for one another. Have you ever met a couple like that? It's like, how did she ever end up with him? <laughs> this is just bizarre. Um, well, later, much later, the wife told me the backstory. They were both in their early 20s during the early 70s Jesus movement. Um, this movement was really rife with rapture obsession, right? You've heard of that. Jesus is coming soon to rapture the saints away to heaven. The world then will be under the sway of an antichrist, a shadowy figure, and there will be a seven-year tribulation. Then finally the Lord will come back. 
Well, their pastor uh, or youth leader at the time was certain that the rapture was happening within the next six months. Among those people, there's a lot of date setting. You know, we know exactly the Lord's coming back. I'll never, never forget the book that some of you that are older here remember from Edgar was 88 Reasons the Lord Will Come in 1988. And somehow he was wrong, so the next year wrote 89 Reasons. <laughs> Uh, so, uh, anyway, this uh, young youth leader held that view, and he, this is, this is not a joke, this is a true story. He told this young couple, uh, and all the young, the older teenagers, the late teens, well, and the early marrieds, I mean the early 20s, he said, you guys right away need to find some Christian person to marry, and very quickly, if you ever want to enjoy sex. Well, this couple listened to that counsel, and they got married, despite the fact there wasn't any good reason for them to get married. <laughs> that marriage has suffered strains and difficulties all these years. Now, I'm glad they maintained their covenant, as they should have, but they got married for all the wrong reasons. And that wrong reason was based in particular on a bad eschatology. Now, finally, sometimes these practical effects are, are even perverted. Uh, many years ago in Ohio, I was delivering a lunch speech to a group of pastors, somewhat like this one, urging them to take a stand against and turn back the evils of abortion, and homosexuality, pornography, socialism. Well, there was, afterwards, one of the gentlemen came up, a pastor, very nice, pious man. He said, you know, I really got to thinking about Andrew, and I agree. We pastors all need to do more because there's so much evil in the world, they said. Aborted children and rising homosexuality, and this just sort of widespread pornography, and, and I know that's all bad, but if you think about it, it's really good, because it means Jesus is coming soon. That's, that's what he said to me, not your word. It's good, because it means Jesus is coming soon. Now, if that idea sounds perverse to you, that's because it is. Now, not all practical effects of our eschatology are so pronounced or as bizarre as the three ones I mentioned. But there are always practical effects, make no mistake. There are always practical effects of our eschatology. So get the right one, and the right one is the optimistic one, postmillennialism. But let's think about the practical effects of an optimistic eschatology. Oh my, how different they are than what I've described. If you believe that the cross and the resurrection that were established at Christ's uh, early, earthly kingdom, if you believe it'll only roll forward despite great opposition and the salvation of multitudes of unbelievers and create Christian culture eventually, wherever it goes. If you believe that while there are crests and dips in that kingdom throughout history, eventually it will win everywhere in the earth. I say, if you believe all of that, you'll live a radically different life. You'll wake up in the morning with a heart full of joy and hope and enthusiasm. You'll pray big prayers, expecting God to answer. You'll expect the gospel to be effective if God's people will only trust his promises. You'll work to influence those around you to operate in terms of the law of God. If you're a software engineer or a school teacher or a homeschool mom or an auto repairman or a bricklayer or a roofer or a nurse or other medical professional, man or woman, rich or poor, middle class, you will work to extend the kingdom of God in your sphere that God has called you to. And you will expect that God will bless your efforts, not because of you, but because of the promises of his holy word. You know that one day you'll die, but your kingdom work will continue in your family and in your church. You'll invest in churches and ministries that preach the gospel of eschatological hope. Also, another thing. You'll be disappointed, even angered, when Joe Biden and Kamala Harris are in office. But you won't throw in the towel. Oh, that's it. We worked so hard to get President Trump elected. And now look at these people at the White House. That's terrible. I think I'm going to quit. No, you'll stand up and speak with greater boldness and act in greater obedience, knowing that God will one day tear them down. You won't engage in flight from this world, but in a fight for this world. You'll be an optimist, not a pessimist. That doesn't mean you'll always just be happy. It means that your outlook will always be one of hope and expectation about what God is doing and will do. And you'll think about that wonderful verse, including 1 Corinthians 15. Paul, this great long chapter on the truth of the resurrection. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory 
through our Lord Jesus Christ, therefore. Therefore, my beloved brethren and brethren, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. Uh, every uh, morning after breakfast, my wife and I, we have a, a very old Anglican hymnal. Actually, it's just the lyrics. Uh, it's remarkable how many great old hymns there, there are. Many of them we don't even sing. This one, I didn't even know. Uh, it was uh, written by a man called J. Condor, 18, uh, 1789 to 1855, and it just sparkles with the truths that I've been trying to convey. So let me read these lyrics. Think about this. The Lord is king. Lift up thy voice, O earth, and all ye heavens rejoice. From world to world the joy shall ring. The Lord omnipotent is king. The Lord is king. Who then shall dare resist his will, distrust his care, or murmur at his wise decrees, or doubt his royal promises? He reigns. Ye saints, exalt your strength. Your God is king. Your father reigns. And he is at his father's side, the man of love, the crucified. A light pervaded by his eye, all parts of his dominion lie. This world of ours and worlds unseen and thin the boundary between. Our one Lord, one empire, all secures. He reigns, and life and death are yours. Through earth and death, uh, through earth and heaven, one song shall ring. The Lord omnipotent is king. I gotta tell you, you just don't really hear even updated songs like that anymore in the church. Hear about one my wife said she heard about, maybe you've heard it, it's sort of the, it's sort of the Kayla theology. <laughs> I gotta tell you, man, I'm so upset by all of these youth, oh, I'm sorry, music ministers and elders allowing church leaders allowing it to happen. They basically just sort of decide their Sunday playlist from Kayla. And uh, songs directed to the Lord, uh, I am I'm the branch and you're the hurricane, and other just nutty things like that. Um, <clears throat> I'm not saying there are not good songs written today. I think the Gettys and others have written some very, very good songs. But I've got to tell you, a lot of those older hymns had some real iron mm -hmm. in their theology. By the way, every hymn teaches theology. Every hymn teaches theology. And though some of you are elders here, and some of you folks grew up and be elders, leaders in the church, never make this assumption that, well, you know, as long as what we sing is basically pretty good, then I'm not worried about it. Every hymn teaches theology. I recommend the elders every week, if you if you guys do a list of songs, and if you don't pick them, if you do have a music leader in the church, you as elders have the right to see that list every week. No, we're not seeing that. No, we're not seeing that. That's the job of elders and church leaders, yeah. and not to outsource everything. I'm not going to say anything. I'm not going to say anything about this guy. He's really cool. He has a master's degree in music, and uh, he's really smart, and he wears really tight jeans. And he's really <laughs> God-honoring music. All music teaches theology. you got to make sure it teaches the right theology. Would you like to know then in conclusion one of the principal reasons the church is so weak, emaciated, and defeated today? Not because she doesn't have enough money. Not because she has too many uneducated people. Uh, not because she's not sufficiently relevant. It's because she expects to be weak, emaciated, and defeated. The church revels in an eschatology of defeat believes the most they can do is get enough money to build a new Sunday school annex or send a few more missionaries and happy if the church grows numerically. It doesn't matter what's happening outside the culture. The church revels in a protology of defeat. Right from the beginning, the church sees defeat. So my precious friends, I urge you to stand on the promises of the word of God. Live in victory. We are soldiers not just of the cross, but also soldiers of the resurrection and ascension. Satan's victory is not predestined before the second advent. Christ's victory is predestined before the second advent. We're called to faithfulness and zeal and expectation. Yes, in the face of hardship, persecution, martyrdom, and death. <clears throat> yes, we might end up dying for the faith, but the faith will not die. The faith will grow and grow. The small stone flung by the sovereign God of the kingdoms of this world is becoming a mountain that fills the entire earth. Uh, how many of you have seen the movie? It's quite good. Uh, some Christian movies are pretty substandard. Yeah. But it's called uh, Risen, about the resurrection of Christ. It came out a few years ago. It's quite biblical.
fight with it. Uh, at one point, uh, part of the plot is there's a Roman centurion uh, that is charged with finding the body of Jesus Christ because these, there's a rumor going around that he rose from the dead. And that rumor has to be quelled. And so Pilate basically summons this centurion and says, you go out there, there's that body somewhere, you find that body and bring him to me so I can show everyone that all these so-called disciples of Jesus are just spinning tails. Well, he looks and he looks and he looks all over the place and he just about he threatens people. <clears throat> well, he comes back to Pilate eventually and he's starting to lose heart. He says, you know, he says, I find this hard to believe, but I looked everywhere and I, I can't find this body. I've done everything you've asked me to do and it could be, I guess, it could be that he's alive. And Pilate says, he says these words in the movie. He says, well, you find him and bring him to me, bring him to me and I'll kill him again. Good luck with that. <laughs> Jesus Christ is King of kings and Lord of lords. He is full of life and he has given life to his church, his people. He's given us the promises of the word of God, of his great gospel promises, of the expansion of his kingdom by the power of the spirit not through merely our native intelligence, but through the power of the Spirit. And we will one day inherit the earth. This earth was designed for godly dominion, not ungodly dominion. And therefore, we will inherit the earth. We, or those following us, Christians, those faithful to the Lord, are the inheritors. We have time maybe for one or two questions. Yes, sir. So you quoted someone who said that God doesn't make junk, and that the junk wouldn't mix. Yes. So I'm sure you've been asked this, but what do you make of passages like the Second Peter, where it seems to say that God stored enough the earth for fire and brimstone? Yeah, good, good question. Yeah, uh, that's actually language that's coming into language. If you're reading the Old Testament, this idea of stars falling and of the burning of the elements and all that—that's not something that Peter made up. That actually is language that I believe refers to the world. People say, well, don't you believe the world can be destroyed? Oh, yes, the world's been destroyed several times. But that doesn't mean the creation has been destroyed. By world, I mean a whole conception and way of life is destroyed. The world was destroyed by a flood. But that doesn't mean that God junk the good creation. So I believe right there what he's talking about. Peter Lightheart's written an excellent commentary on that. If you want a short commentary on that, he really persuaded me years ago. Um, that that's talking about God's terrible, horrific, world-ending judgment on um, the Jews, the apostate Jews, of course, in AD 70. Now, when you first read it, you say, man, it's just one day there's just going to be this like heavenly fireball. It's just all the, all the Christians are going to be gone about now. It's flamethrower. <laughs> and then he's going to throw it away. But actually, Revelation doesn't say that. It says, look, look, read the last part of Revelation. <coughs> John says, <clears throat> Excuse me. I saw a new heavens and a new earth. Now we hear the word new and we think it means like brand new. But that's not the way new is used many times in the Bible. A new means a new phase. For instance, we speak, even ourselves speak today of uh, a new moon. Oh, then tonight's going to be a new moon. What's that mean like that God pulled the old moon out of the sky and threw it away and created a new one? No, it means it's in this new phase. So the new heavens and the new earth are in many ways the purified and resurrected heavens and earth in which righteousness will dwell. So that's this, this picture, of course, is fire, is, is purging. And there will be a new heavens and a new earth. Incidentally, and I'll conclude with this, um, there in Revelation chapter 21, the first what's four verses, I think, the Bible says that in the eternal state, we don't go up to the Lord to live in heaven. That's not what it says. It says that God himself comes down to this new heavens and new earth with the new Jerusalem and lives with us. Which means that you and I are going to belong to Christ, and I believe all of you do, are going to live eternally on this earth. Now, not as it presently looks. It will be purified. It will be new and renewed and resurrected. But yeah, I mean, you'll be living on this same earth, and who knows what God, God doesn't say much about it. Maybe you'll still get to live in North Carolina or Tennessee. But I know one thing, we're not off in sort of outer space in Star Trek land or something with aliens flying around us. That's not it. <laughs> the eschatological promise of the word of God is the new heavens and the new earth where righteousness will dwell. The new heavens, and, by the way, notice the heavens have to be cleansed too. 
You know, the heavens are created. People say, well, the heaven was always there because that's where God lives. That God doesn't need anywhere to live. I mean, God is a spirit being. And Solomon says that. But God created the heavens as sort of a, a dwelling place for him to relate to earth. He doesn't need heavens to dwell somewhere. Where, where does God hang his hat? He doesn't need to hang his hat anywhere. So those heavens have to be cleansed also. And we live forever on a new earth. By the way, that also shows how much God thinks of this created reality. God thinks so much of this created reality that he will one day exist here forever with his people. That's how much he loves this earth and loves his people. Okay, thank you very much.